Sorry for starting a little bit late. I'm Anna and this is Cycling UK Live. We're having a little bit of a tech issue um, whilst Lizzie's trying to, well, she doesn't actually have Wi-Fi, <laughs> but she's using 3G and we're just trying to get sorted on, um, on the screen. So I just want to say hello to everybody whilst that's warming up and getting ready. I particularly want to ask if anybody is watching this evening from a cycling club. Because we do know that a few of you have joined in with some of your mates and you've said to each other, well, let's all let's all join in from our cycling club and watch at the same time. So if you're doing that and you want to mention your club, pop it in the chat bar. So just write it down, write it in the chat bar and I'll give you guys a shout out. Um, I'm Anna Glavinsky. You all know who we're here to see today. Uh, she'll be on very, very soon. But in the meantime, why doesn't everybody just get themselves a drink as well? I'm back with my light bulb glass got white wine today so what are you drinking again comments in the chat bar we'd love to hear them love to see them or we can just talk in hieroglyphics and you can throw your comments in using an emoji so are you drinking a glass of wine a beer a cocktail you don't even need to type it out you can just pop in hello john otley cycle club yes and lizzie's your patron fantastic i can imagine that you guys have got a bit of a fan a fan group watching today that's brilliant saffron Devontree cycling club hello welcome thank you so much for joining in today how are you coping with this lockdown situation as well uh craig pendle forest cycling club in lancashire nice one matthew from home first cycling club brilliant i love the really good grammar that's going on here as well everyone's putting their capital letters in the right place um shout out to the all female cycling club yes we're going to be going into women's cycling today um the queensbury queens it's the highest cycling club in yorkshire you guys sound brilliant uh freya hiya thank you um from dursley road club nice one st austell wheelers uh rebecca hi we're gonna have you on very soon joining from landan okay we're doing the cycling club thing i also definitely want to do the drink thing I don't want to be alone in this one. Shout out to the VCL. That was the very first cycling club that I ever joined as well. Velo Club de Londres. Um, hearing it for all the cycling groups in Yorkshire. Yes, Lizzie's got her fan club there and ready. That's her hometown. And oh, we've got someone on a turbo trainer. Tony, what? you're just putting me to shame. Here I am boozing it up and you're on the turbo. Ah. I do, I do have a little bit of a cycling story behind this glass of wine, though. Um, I'm actually in Spain right now. So you guys in the UK should count yourselves lucky because I'm on week five or six. I don't, I've completely lost track of time, actually, of serious lockdown. Like over here, you're not allowed to cycle. You're not allowed to walk. You're, you're not allowed to leave the house. Like lockdown is lockdown. Um, but I had some really good news. And my car, from not being used, the battery went flat. So I was allowed to cycle to the shops and I needed to get my wine in for this evening. Got my bike out, but it was chucking it down with rain. And I am not exaggerating. Honestly, I, I never exaggerate. I'm not one to exaggerate. But the rain was coming down so hard, I thought it was going to break the windows in my house. It was that torrential. So you guys have got better weather and you're allowed out on your bikes. I waited for a little gap in the clouds, a little bit of sun came out and uh, got on the bike, started cycling down the road, but obviously the road was a bit wet, didn't bring a puncture repair kit and what happened? <sighs> yes, you guessed it. And it started raining again. So there I was walking along the side of the road, dragging my bike along behind me. But the point of this story, the moral of this story is that I succeeded. I got my wine. I walked myself to the petrol station and made sure that I had my drink ready for this evening's chat. Um, some people, are, some people are drinking tea. Is that right? Oh God! Oh, what are you got? You're all so healthy. You're turbo training. You're tea drinking. <laughs> I mean, hi Helen. Cheers. Yes, you're on the beer like that one. And Roz, no turbo here. You're eating mini eggs. Happy Easter. Uh, Dave, Darrington Dordlers Cycling Club. You sound like a fast bunch. Um, hi, Craig from the Nelson Wheelers. Diane, you! Big shout out to the Newport Shropshire CC and Breeze. Of course, Breeze are fantastic for the efforts that they're doing getting more women on bikes. So, and a massive shout out to Breeze Ride Leaders as well. 
Oh gosh, all these all these shout outs, which is fantastic. Dave from the CTC Northampton. Um, will the women's tour return to Northamptonshire for a sixth time? Is that a question for Lizzie, for me, or just for the universe? Let's find out. Um, Hannah, you're all out of beer and wine. Oh, we've got a mountain biker on here. Yeah. Guy after my own heart. Fantastic. Cheers from the Warsthorn Mountain Bike Club. Cheers to that one. And peppermint, oh, peppermint tea. You're not even on the caffeine, Lynette. You lot are so healthy. Is there anyone here that's on the protein shakes? Please tell me that this is not happening. <laughs> on your turbo trainers and your, your protein shakes. Um, <laughs> question from Rebecca for me. Anna, what do you make of the success to come out of our local club VCL as its youth development leading to the World Tour and Olympics? Yeah, it is something that we're all very proud of locally, as many people who are joining this um, chat tonight are very proud of Bear Lizzie from up in Yorkshire. Down south in London, we've had um, Freddie Wright and Ewan, how, how do you say his surname? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that but um yeah vcl has been fantastic in um getting people to the top level of the proteins and we've got some under 23s at the moment that are doing fantastic things in the international scene so you always feel a bit proud when it's like a local lad don't you no one can ever pronounce warstorn was was thorn was thorn was thorn craig can you write it down in a way that's meant to be written how i say it Yes, Saffron, thank you for opening your bottle. I don't want to feel left out here. I'm enjoying it too much. And Chris, greetings from the fat biking community. Now that's a little bit different. That's a little bit original. What led you to take up fat biking? Do you live near the snow or the sand? Red, red wine for Fred Bear. And a shout out to the Marmot Cycling Club. Um, worst, worst thorn. Worst thorn. Okay, I've got that one. Hey up, Brian. Cheers. Grab yourself a drink. Hopefully it won't be too long now till Lizzie joins us. Um, so let's just see what they're saying there. Right, cool. So I just want to give you guys a little bit of background about what we're actually doing here tonight. It's uh, been put on by Cycling UK, which is a charity. Um, many of you here are already members, so shout out to you guys. Um, and some of you are here to watch Lizzie and you maybe don't know much about Cycling UK. So Cycling UK is the body getting more people with cycling onto bikes safely, enjoyably and easily. So we want to see more bums on saddles and we want to see bigger numbers and people cycling safely and loving it, making uh, cycleways more accessible. Loads of campaigns, actually, campaigns about women cycling, getting more women on bikes because women are underrepresented in this sport, underrepresented in this sport and there's no reason for that so Cycling UK are doing lots of work around getting more women on bikes and it's a topic we're going to go into a little bit later on this evening and a campaign that I really want to draw your attention to this evening is for our free membership for NHS workers so is anyone here an NHS worker if you are first up I'm going to put my glass down thank you Thank you so much for all the hard work that you guys are doing, saving lives on the front line at the moment. Um, we're at Cycling UK are offering free membership to NHS workers. Um, if you know anyone who's an NHS worker who would like to benefit from this, who's maybe started cycling to work uh, recently, you know, there's lots of changes happening. People are trying new things. People are avoiding public transport. They get free membership, which means they get insurance, which is brilliant, a bit of peace of mind. Uh, they get hints and tips and advice. They get to enjoy um, information about road clubs and cycle routes and discounts and buying things in shops. So it's brilliant. And if anyone else would like to become a member, please do. You're more than welcome. You can also donate to us our um, NHS campaign and become a member or just become a member yourself and knowing that your money not only gives you that peace of mind and all those bonuses and extras but also that um oh sorry just read it, reading the bar there but also that your money is going to a great voice and a great cause that benefits of all of us cyclists hey janet you're having a chili and a nice glass of red in the wirral yeah shout, shout, shout out to the wirral bicycle bells Cheers, more women cycling. So I'm just going to check on the private chat. 
Um, we're going to have Lizzie on for the moment, just in audio, I'm afraid. We're not going to see her lovely face, which is a huge disappointment. Um, but hopefully we can get that sorted out as we go along. So, oh, I'll just let the cat out of the bag, even though everybody already knew. Our guest today, I'm just going to run through a few of her accolades. She is an Olympic road race silver medalist, a world track champion, a two times road world cup series winner 2015 world race world, it's the w's and the r's that get me world road race champion and a commonwealth road race champion everyone please get your thumbs on the smiley faces here on the emoji and put it in the chat bar if you do a blue thumbs up or a nice heart that's lovely but we can't see it in the chat here on our screen and i really want lizzie to know how excited we are to see her tonight or at least hear her um, so please get those smiley faces into the chat bar because we can't do a round of applause, but we want to welcome Lizzie Diagnan. Hey Lizzie. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you at least and hopefully oh, we'll be able to see you a little bit later on as well. Yeah, I'm currently updating my software, so fingers crossed. <laughs> We're talking technology here, aren't we? It's um, techno technological software. Yeah, basically, I am. I'm talented at cycling and anything else, not so much. I'm finding out. <laughs> Is it, do, I didn't realise that talent was an all or nothing thing. It's like, so if you can either be like quite good at lots of things or the best at something and rubbish at everything else. Is that how it works? <laughs> well, I thought so until I've met, yeah, I've met too many talented female cyclists, like intelligent Abby. Um, <laughs> my teammate Abby's incredible artist. She's an incredible bike rider. She's one of those annoyingly talented people but uh yeah i'm i'm just a cyclist clearly right tonight. <laughs> so <Right>. unfair performance <laughs> you have taken it to next levels though you have done done very well with it i must say um, and you got into you got into racing cycling like many of the successful girls of your your era i suppose through the bc talent team so they came to your school and they were looking for cycling potential and you got picked up so what was your relationship to cycling before that um, not a particularly good one. <laughs> um, I sort of, I mean, if you we're going back kind of 15 years now and cycling in the UK was not the coolest sport. Cycling to me when I was a 15 year old was something that my granddad did in kind of baggy see-through lycra. <laughs> so it wasn't um, the coolest sport. Um, and can you hear me? Yeah, still got you, still got you. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so... I wasn't interested in it at all, really. I knew about the Tour de France just because it was something that everybody knew about. And I used to go to France camping on holidays with my family. But other than that, it was a very kind of distant idea of a sport. I was more into netball and hockey at school. So, um, yeah, I had a bike to kind of play around on with my mates, but nothing serious. And then you suddenly got plucked out of nowhere and said, hey, you could be really good at this. Was that enough yeah. to make you think, all right, I'll give it a go then? even though you weren't that interested? Yeah, basically. Um, I was really lucky that the person who spotted me was a, a man called Phil West, and he was my first coach. And he just was a very talented person at working with young people, really. He made um, everybody feel um, confident, and I felt like I really found something that I had a talent for. And like I say, I was I was kind of just doing hockey and netball and those sorts of things. And I didn't stand out in anything, but cycling was the first thing that I was really good at, which, you know, everybody likes to do something that they're very good at. <laughs> and so what was it that suited you about cycling? Was it just a purely physical thing? You had the right body shape, weight to power ratio, or was, or was it a mindset that you were looking for as well? I think a combination, yeah. Um, I'd always been very fit just because of the way I was brought up, I think. I mean, I spent my childhood outdoors and doing lots of different sports so I already had a very good base level of fitness and then probably my body type you know bottom heavy <laughs> so strong legs and smaller upper body and um, I mean most of it comes from your mindset and I definitely am one of those people that enjoys suffering and being dedicated to something so that's probably more than half of it I would say. And so you got into it literally from day one with the aim to be the best. That was your objective. Um, and so you were aiming towards that the whole time. Was there ever, did there ever come a point where you thought, oh, I actually 
quite like this sport in its own right, you know, aside from just getting the results. But I'm actually yeah. enjoying it. Yeah, I think that moment came for me um, actually probably when I had my maternity leave because it was the first time that I'd stepped away from the sport and it wasn't my job anymore. I didn't need to train um, and I realised I needed to train. I needed it for my mental health and I realised just how much I love just bike riding because so much of my time on a bike was about training and I I very rarely went for just bike rides and actually I did that for nine months and it was just so nice and I started to appreciate that I have the best job in the world and prior to that I didn't really totally understand that so I was (laughs) I was lucky to have that kind of pause and realize that. And do you think if it hadn't become cool that you would like it as much because you, you seem to think that it's become a cooler sport than it was when you were 15. Um, I mean, if I still had to wear big baggy men's cycling shorts, then probably I wouldn't like it as much as I do now, no. (laughs) Um, You know, the sport has moved on in terms of being cool, but also being inclusive. And, um, you know, I'm, I train in the best kit. I'm sponsored by Santini and I'm I'm in women's specific clothing. I'm on a women's specific equipment a lot of the time from Trek and I just, the sport has moved on and it is cooler yes so yeah that does add to enjoyment I suppose because when I was 15 I was still doing bike racing that that was probably the peak of my career to be fair what has probably happened a few years before that um but I I was also like mortified about the fact that I was cycling I remember when I was about 15 and I had my first boyfriend and I told him I couldn't see him one weekend because I had a family dinner but it was actually because I was doing a bike race and he never knew that I did bike racing I was just so embarrassed about it and also some girls at school threw my bike in a pond because I was like the only girl at school to cycle there and it was just really it was really embarrassing it was such an embarrassing sport and then I was trying to decide like did cycling become cooler or did we just grow up and realize that actually it doesn't matter what people think and if you love what you're doing it's it's cool that's what makes it cool yeah I guess so I think you'd have to ask a current 15 year old I suppose whether it was cool or not I like I was the same when I was 15 I didn't go around my friend's house in my lycra or anything like that um I kind of kept it pretty quiet um but yeah you grow out of that and you don't care as long as you're enjoying it but I think it's cooler than it was but like I say yeah I don't hang out with many teenagers anymore. <laughs> That's a really good point. Anyone, so shout out to the audience here. If anyone is living with teenagers, or teenagers in the house, do they think cycling is cool? This is probably the biggest, most important question of the night. So go and find out the answers and we'll come back to you <laughs> very shortly. And right now we're going to go back to your career for a little bit, um, Lizzie. You, you, you had some successes really, really early on um, on the track. But then you decided to drift more towards road racing, which was, I, I suppose, would have given you much more personal independence. It was a, an independent decision to do that. So what what made you want to do that and how hard was it? Yeah, it was very difficult, but um, definitely the right decision. I think going into 2012, um, basically, I was a points race rider on the track and, and that was an Olympic event in Beijing. The the only Olympic event that GB didn't medal in in Beijing. Um, And I won the first World Cup after Beijing in the points race. So it was great. I was like, okay, this is kind of my my spot um, in London, potentially. And then the UCI changed the the rules or, you know, the programme in London and they put in the Omnium. Um, And they changed that Omnium format quite a lot as well going into London so the the timed events became really important and I've never been a good pursuiter I've never been a good 200 meter uh, specialist at all my talent has always been about suffering and recovering um, after intense efforts really quickly that's always been my advantage and my tactical awareness in a points race so that became less important um, and the team pursuit becoming the main focus for British cycling because it's effectively a banker medal. If you've got the fastest team in the world, then you're assured a medal. Whereas if you have the, you know, the fastest points racer in the world or the fastest Omnium rider, you're not guaranteed medals. And that's where funding comes from. So all the focus from British cycling was on 
the team pursuit. And um, I mean, those medals that the women and the men have won in the team pursuit over the years are the most deserved Olympic medals because the training for the team pursuit, in my opinion, was just awful. (laughs) Um, It's just, you know, so intense. Uh, You're scrutinized. Every single lap you do is measured and measured against the other women in the team. So it's a constant pressure um, to perform. And there's not that many racing. Your training is indoors, obviously, in Manchester. And I just realised that I didn't like it anymore. I I hated going to the track every day. And I decided to try and make it on the road. And at the time, we had Nicole Cook, we had Emma Emma Pooley, Sharon Laws. We had a really successful road team. And I'd done a couple of kermesses in Belgium and had a bit of success for somebody that didn't really train on the road. And... I just decided one day I'm going to give it a go. And I did. Thank goodness. <laughs> and But how do you do that? Because you you went from a very structured environment, I imagine, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, that, that talent team and then growing, being part of Team GB, you're very nurtured to then doing international road racing um, all over. That, that, as I mentioned earlier, it's very independent. So how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I think looking back, it, it makes me I'm sort of proud of the fact that I did it. But at the time, it didn't seem like a big deal. I um, I had a small car and I packed it up and I moved to a house in Belgium that is supported by the Dave Rayner Fund. Um, Joss and Tim Harris live in a place in Belgium and they kind of rent out rooms for a small fee to young cyclists. And as a female cyclist, the best place to be was Belgium because there's kermes, as they call them. Basically, to have a cycling club in Belgium, you have to put on a bike race. And they're usually put on at the same time as the local fair. So there's a bit of a buzz about them and the circuit town races. And um, you can race like three times a week if you want in Belgium um, relatively cheaply. And that's where you get spotted and you get picked up by bigger teams who then cover your expenses and you know eventually give you a contract etc so um i luckily had signed with uh, lotto at the time um i signed for 200 euros a month and uh, moved over to belgium and kind of survived um but again i got very lucky because the manager of that team danny schumbert who still runs the women's lotto team which is now affiliated to the men's team so they're you know a lot more professional than they were but his daughter was um, a cyclist on the team as well and it felt like a bit of a family so they sort of took me under their wing and looked after me and I kind of got more and more results that year and was eventually spotted by Cervelo Test Team and that's where kind of my professional road career started. And you definitely well then you definitely had your chance to prove yourself and that you weren't just doing it to make a point because I guess when you had that 2009 goal in the, in the team pursuit it would did it, did it give you a carrot that you thought I want to have more success and was that carrot not enough to make you just think I'm just going to stick at this one sport that seems easier or I have to go my own way do, do you know what I'm asking like yeah I think it, that it's not a case of, of being at the lead it, it's not a case of, I think if you make the Great Britain team pursuit team, then you're almost guaranteed a medal. I I feel like touching on wood. I don't want to curse anybody. But, um, (laughs) you know, they are phenomenally fast and incredible athletes. And, you know, I would have no chance getting in that team pursuit team now. The women in that team are incredibly fast. So it's it's certainly not an easier option. But it's a more guaranteed option of success, like in terms of quantifiable success like a road yeah. race you could still be the strongest in the world and have a puncture or whatever and you're out so um I wasn't tempted no by that team pursuit gold because it sort of felt like a tick in the box in terms of my first rainbow jersey that was incredibly exciting but um yeah I just I needed to do what I enjoyed and I just yeah. didn't enjoy team pursuiting Fair enough, fair enough. And it did pay off. Um, what would you say was the first result on the road where you just thought, I've done this, this is the big result in front of everyone? And how did it feel? Oof. Uh, 
God, that's a good question. I feel like I'm so old now. I can't remember. Oh, don't just stop that and stop. <laughs> um, my first result on the road, it was probably a small race in Holland called Borsela. Um, and it it's a really hard, windy race. You have to be switched on all the time. And Kirsten Wild was there. She's obviously had loads of success since. Um, and she was winning even then. Um, and I, and I, yeah, I was in the breakaway and I was riding with them. You know, I wasn't just hanging on to the breakaway and I managed to get third place. And I think that was the first time that people were like, oh, who's this person? Yeah. And then let's just fast forward to that you became World Road Race Champion in 2015. What was that just a dream come true? Was it early for you? Did you wish that you'd got it sooner? How did it feel? Um, yeah, I wish I'd won in Pomverada the year before, but I think most people who win a world title have been in a position where they've missed the world title beforehand. If you, I mean, you don't suddenly be come in a position where you can be a world champion it takes years of working progression so I think I had the opportunity or the like the strength to be able to do it in Pomferida but tactically I didn't race very well so um, in Richmond I'd had an amazing season so I was one of the favourites going into it so to be able to deliver as a favourite was a bit surreal really because yeah I never expected to be a favourite going into a world championships let alone taking it but very emotional as well very emotional what's more what feels more important to you olympics or world championships uh it's weird I, because yeah it kind of creeps up on you you know as i say I, I wasn't a cyclist as such growing up it was it was not something that i really registered but i always watched the olympics and i was just amazed by olympians so um the Olympics, probably, um, but as a cyclist, the rainbow jersey is iconic. So, I mean, <laughs> either I'd be happy with. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, yeah. Um, right. So I'm just going to remind people what we're doing here, what's going on with Cycling UK. Do you want to see if anything's happening with the um, camera on your on your um, iPad? Yes, I'm just uh, going to get to that. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of minutes if you want to look into that and just going to say hi to the audience again. Um, thanks everyone for your comments so far, especially those of you who have got in touch with your teenagers and uh, given your results, your answers. Um, so we've got Adrian here who says his 17 year old thinks that cycling is cool, but his 16 year old hates it. And Saffron, who coaches kids, does see numbers drop around the 13 to 16 year olds mark. It's really common that, isn't it? And then it's, it seems to be like there's a dip and then it starts again. It's, if people have started young, they nearly always come back to it. And Lisa think, Lisa says her team think that cycling is nerdy. But yes, they, I'm sure they will come back to it at some point. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? I hope you're enjoying it. Um, also, don't forget to put, get your questions in for Lizzie. She will be asking them, answering them at the end. And I hope you might get a little bit of luck with the video. Fingers crossed. Uh, so we're putting on these live events with Cycling UK. We're speaking to some of the UK's best cyclists across different disciplines. So we're very honoured to have Lizzie with us tonight. Um, Cycling UK, for those of you who don't know about us, we are a charity. It's, it's the national charity um, advocating the rights of cyclists, getting more people on bikes, cycling, cycling safely and easily. We back a number of campaigns, all sorts of different things, getting um, cycling more accessible, rights of way opened up, uh, campaigning for women's cycling. And also a big one that I want to draw your attention to is the NHS uh, free campaign. So NHS workers can join Cycling UK as members for free at the moment. It's a crazy time that we're all living through, unprecedented times. Um, and the NHS workers are really putting their lives on the line and fighting for the health of our country. And many of them are starting to cycle to work for the first time. Uh, so if you know anyone who is an NHS worker who would benefit from what we're offering, it's uh, they get insurance, they get tips and hints and advice and discounts. 
across a load of uh, cycle shops and products. So do send them our way. They can join the membership for free. Uh, check it out on our website. We've got Lizzie Diagnan with us today. Um, we're having a little bit of a tech issue where we can't see her face. <laughs> How's I'm it going? getting there. I am getting there, I think. Yeah? Should, should I give you a few more minutes then? Okay. Okay, cool. I'll just uh, have a little monologue. It's much better when the audience gets involved. Hi, Matt. Oh, who would Lizzie most like to interview? So these will be questions for Lizzie that will come to towards the end. Hi, Daniel from Durham. Nice to see that um, the Northern contingent is here in its force supporting Lizzie today. She always does have a, a big home crowd following, which is, I'm like, yeah, Durham. It's, is, is Durham in Yorkshire? How's my geography? I know it's north of London. <laughs> um, and how's that turbo training session going? Who was that earlier on who was on their turbo trainer? I'm just scrolling up, scrolling up here to see if I can find your name. Um, oh, my brother's on here. Hey, bro. You're having some wine as well. That's nice. Um, so who was it? Who was it that was on their turbo trainer? Have you finished your session yet? I really struggle with the turbo training. It's so hard. Like Lizzie, prefer to be outdoors if I can. Much better. Uh, so, how, so audience, question about riding indoors on turbo trainers. Uh, now that lockdown is partially in place, you're still allowed out for your bike rides. Are you using your turbo trainers more in the house? How are you finding it? I know that Rebecca, who's watching at the moment, she has been learning tricks on the rollers. So maybe I'm going to put, I'm going to put her on the spot here. Actually, we'll get we'll get her to show off those tricks on the rollers next week. <laughs> of course, you're asking about Netflix. Durham's in County Durham. Oh, <laughs> do you know what? As well, Mark, I studied geography at university. Yeah, true fact. Embarrassing. And Janie is from Northumberland, not York. I'm not going to read out how you spelt that. Um, cool. So we're just hoping that Lizzie might be able to get her video up and going for the last half of this interview. So fingers crossed there. Um, how's I'm it looking? Trying. Do you reckon? <laughs> I'm trying. So I've downloaded my new software, and um, now they can't. Now he's telling me that he can't find my camera, which is impossible because it's there. I hate technology. Oh, so do I. Have we got any tech geeks on this? On this chat? On this chat? Some people. Blame the wine, terrible. Gary. Yes, I blame the wine for my lack of geography knowledge. <laughs> 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 Dan so you're doing loads of turbo work in your garage structured workouts see this is what I don't like about it it's the, as soon as I hear see the word structure and the word workout I'm zoned out and virtual riding but not the one that begins with Z El Griego my teammate from Gibraltar hopefully to see you soon yes we're going to meet in real life very soon hopefully for wild rock outing we got some berms and some step ups to ride. Uh, thanks for joining, El Griego. Do you know what? Actually, you're my teammate, and I don't actually know your real name. <laughs> Do I even need to? You are El Griego, the Greek. And um, over unders for the win. I don't even know what that means. Stumped. Um. God, we've got someone from the Outer Hebrides watching. Wow. That's amazing. Fantastic. We've got the Outer Hebrides. We've got Gibraltar. I'm in Spain. They're spreading out. Who's the furthest? Who's the furthest away? Is anybody watching this from somewhere that's either further than Gibraltar, Spain, or the Outer Hebrides? And I mean further from... England Central. That's the geographical point. Have we got anybody further? Us. Oh, hi Emma. Glad that you're on the red wine. Glad you're enjoying the chat. Hopefully, you might see a bit of Lizzie's face. 
But if not, we'll go into this. I'll say we'll give it one more minute, one more minute of chat, and if not, we'll just um, we'll just carry on with the audio as it is. It's great talking to you anyway. Have you ever done radio interviews, Lizzie? Uh, I have, yeah. Really it's just the same know. as that then, really, isn't it? Mm, kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can all pretend we're listening to the radio. Um, Saffron's doing lots of rides on the Watt bike. No way. Yes, Tom. Cleveland, Ohio, United States. Cheers to that. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. What time is it over there? Yeah, it's about bedtime. Yeah, is it not bedtime? Tom, what is it not bedtime? <laughs> and are you, are you a Brit over there or are you a true American? How are you finding how are you finding the accents? I guess mine's a London accent. Lizzie's is slightly Yorkshire. I'd only slightly, to... do you think? I say only slightly. Yeah, Maybe it's probably it's... diluted a bit. I was going to say, do you think it's changed over the years? Yeah, I think so. You have to speak very slowly and uh, without accent if you want your teammates to understand you in a bike race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone from Mercia in Spain, just up the road from me. Nice one. Philip's guessing it's lunchtime in Cleveland. And Tom is a true American. Hell oh, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Well, Lizzie, we're, we're just going to stick with your dulcet tones then, if that's, that's all right. right. Yeah. Um, and let's just have a little quick chat about the women's scene, the women's cycle pro scene. Where do you think the UK is at? in terms of offering pro road racing and actually that's a question across both genders men and women's and how does it compare to other countries Poof, um well as a professional in terms of the races that we have in the uk uh, i think we we do really well the women's tour de yorkshire is a massive race it's growing in prestige every year um but for me the the best race that we have on our calendar is the women's tour i think the organization and the professionalism of that is unrivaled anywhere um it's just a shame that this year it's been cancelled um but hopefully you know next year that it will be back um and in terms of the men's scene i think in the UK, things have taken a turn for the worse. I could be wrong at the moment, but there seems to be um, a few teams folding, um, which is obviously sad, but I don't know what the solution is. Um, obviously, I hear lots of different opinions from different people, but um, I'm certainly no expert on what needs to happen or why it's happened. Yeah, I guess you're, you're often called out to be a spokesperson because you've got a very unique insight into the sport but then sometimes you're there just riding your bike. So, um, and I'm gonna push you on that a little bit today. So just answer with whatever your opinion is. No, no one's expecting you to have all the solutions, but from your from your standpoint um, in women's cycling, what changes have you seen in the professional sport for women over the last 15 years or so since you've been in it? What changes have I seen? Poof, loads. I mean, when I st first started cycling, it was completely different. Like I say, my first sort of professional contract was 200 euros a month. And now I'm on riding for a team where our minimum wage as a standard is 25,000 euros. So that means that a young rider who has potential, who signs for a team like Trek, is a true professional bike rider they have incredible support um and that means that the strength in depth is way uh, bigger and broader than it used to be um there was a small group of women who were winning the races whether they were um mountainous races or bunch sprints and i mean you still have those special athletes like marianne voss who can do it all but it's definitely changed and I think you saw that at the beginning of last season where there was like I think 10 different winners of the first 10 races something like that so um and I think that will increase because there are more and more women who are able to be completely professional which is where the sport needs to go and there were some big changes set for this year actually 2020 rolling out this season um, COVID-19 has obviously put that a little bit on hold, but do you think we would have continued to see the benefits of those changes already this early on, having them been implemented, like more competitive fields, bigger fields um, of, like you say, the word truly professional is in women who can race full time for a living 
and mixing it up with the competition at the front. Yeah, I feel like the ball was finally starting to roll in women's cycling. We are really starting to move places. And um, I just really hope that this season um, doesn't change all that. Obviously, the economic crisis that's going to happen is going to have its effects in professional sport. And I hope that women's cycling isn't um, going to pay for it. Good, good answer. Yeah, that is something I think we're all thinking so short term at the moment on high alert, but there's going to be long term implications of everything that's going on that nobody's nobody's really thought about. And how, how is that affecting you looking forward to the Olympics? Because obviously this was a huge year for you. It's how you, well, you had your sights set on it. I don't want to put words into your mouth. So you, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole reason that I came back to cycling after having my daughter was because I was aiming for an Olympic gold medal so there is something that every athlete knows that in a winter before an Olympics you'd really just given it your everything like every training session you're putting in as much effort as you can and although you do that normally there's something special about an Olympic Games and the training that goes into that winter and the winter that I've had has been really, really hard. <laughs> so obviously I was hugely disappointed that all that hard work has kind of been for nothing, but I know that it's not gone anywhere. I know that the changes I've made to my ability and my performance haven't just disappeared and that I can build on them again for next year. So yeah, I'm disappointed, but um, it's not like the Olympics is cancelled forever. You know, it, it will happen. Yeah. You're remaining motivated. And that winter training, is it taking place in Monaco? It has, yeah, yeah. Because that's sometime. where you're based, isn't it? The yeah. tax haven for the super rich, super famous. Is that your lifestyle? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just hang out on yachts and you know, drink <laughs> champagne all day. Oh, great. Find me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, what, that's where we're based, yeah. So um, very fortunate and it's yeah beautiful place to train beautiful mountains and just consistent weather that's I think most cyclists agree that if you're going to have a good racing season you need a consistent winter of training and yeah. um, that uh, having consistently good weather makes a huge difference yeah absolutely and, and on your health and not getting ill and all of that sort of thing that yeah people probably don't really think about <laughs> so much yeah, exactly. It's hugely important. Um, if you miss a week's training because you have a cold and then you go out again training in the wet and the wind, you're more likely to free your immune system to be kind of susceptible to picking something else up. And it's just can be a bit of a grim cycle if you're having to try and kind of combat the weather in the UK. Very sensible reason to get yourself out on that yacht. I, I can <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Lizzie, I mean, this is a big topic as well for tonight, not just because it's like super cute, but it also is in a way, it's a statement. You are also a mum. You're a mum to Orla, who is two. Am I right? Uh, no, she's not. She's a year and a half. She'll be a year and a half. Um, and you very much didn't want to wait until the end of your career to have a baby. But most athletes tend to do that what what made you confident that you wanted to give this a go and you have that drive you wanted to have a baby but also keep your career going um I don't I don't know I guess um so I've made all these logical decisions as a professional athlete um about my career and I got to a point where I was happily married and desperately wanted to be a mum and it just made an emotional decision that I wanted to start we wanted to start trying for a family and didn't think much beyond that because it's not something you can plan it's not like you know okay well we'll get pregnant this month or we'll do you know it's not yeah. that simple so you kind of just have to go into it open-minded and that's how we were we were open-minded to the possibility of being lucky enough to become parents and thank goodness we did and I suppose once we found out we were pregnant it was then like right okay so what's next and I quickly realized that my motivation and my drive to continue was still there I didn't want to stop cycling so it yeah it was fairly straightforward I suppose <laughs> just just following your heart your gut instinct by the sounds of it did you yeah, reach exactly. out are there any other athletes or cyclists who have also been maintaining their career um pregnant and then having a baby and did you reach out to any of them uh, yeah, I did. Um, Sarah's story was particularly helpful because there's 
very little information out there on on loads of things i mean she has two children she's obviously very successful and um she breastfed both of her children and that's something that i was really wanted to be able to do with Orla and she was really good in advising me on how that would affect training and nutrition etc just really specific stuff that you wouldn't be able to kind of find in in obvious places where you know generally it's kind of much more general advice so it was good to get some specific advice from somebody like Sarah who's done it and so did she help you with the decision of how long to keep cycling whilst you're pregnant or is that something that you just followed your body with and how long did you keep cycling for um I actually just decided to focus on what felt right for me um so I rode my bike three days before Ola was born um just really easy I didn't never did any intensity um I always went out when I felt like it was kind of a low traffic time on on quiet roads um but yeah I I thought before I got pregnant I thought oh gosh I would never risk it I would never go outside and actually when you're pregnant and you know you're in kind of a emotional roller coaster anyway I really needed that kind of um outside space on my bike to cling to and it got me through all the roller coaster of pregnancy to be honest. Sounds like it's just really important to you as a person full stop like you mentioned earlier your mental health and just a part of who you are so it's not going to stop. Yeah basically. Oh, yeah. As as you can. yeah yeah which is very positive positive. and then so likewise on the other side of that after Orla was born how soon was it before you got yourself back on a bike? Um, I actually got back on about three weeks after on the rollers. <laughs> and, uh, wow. well, I put I put my shorts on, and I went on the rollers for about five minutes and got back off. <laughs> so why did I do that? <laughs> um, so I then was I had a word with myself. I was like, right, come on. So I had six weeks completely off, which I needed because the first six weeks of a newborn life is just mental. Um, uh, well, I found it incredibly like overwhelming and tiring and all the rest of it. So the idea of trying to ride a bike to me at that point didn't, I just didn't need to. Um, so I took six weeks, which is kind of what normal non-athletic women are told to take to recover. And I went to see a normal doctor, not a cycling doctor, who gave me the all clear to start exercising again. Brilliant. Um, and so when you did get back on your bike, did you feel like did did you feel like a different person? Uh, you know, had, had hormones affected your body, sleeplessness. You know, both the physical and the emotional sides of having a baby. Um, the timetable. Did you feel like the same person on a bike? How? Did, when did you realise that you could still be this competitive athlete? I was hugely surprised by how quickly my base fitness came back. Like wow. incredibly, but. At the same time, when I think about it, I was still exercising quite a lot when all of us inside me, you know, with an extra sort of 17 kilos carrying yeah. around. So it was normal, I suppose, that you feel a sense of lightness. And in terms of tiredness, you, you're fatigued in terms of your mental capacity. Like I probably wouldn't have been able to go out having a, a ride and chatting to people. But the physical aspect of it it's almost like you have a different energy pathway you're you're shattered like you you're mentally exhausted but physically it's different um you don't feel that tired when you get on the bike I didn't find and um my top end power my strength my pelvis stuff this real specific stuff that you need to be able to win bike races took an awful long time to come back and took a lot of hard work and specific work but my base fitness came back really quickly that's really good to know. I guess you're saying there's different types of tiredness. I suppose even your your average Joe like me can relate to that when sometimes you might get in from a day at work and you feel tired, but actually it's getting out there and doing something that wakes you up more than resting and watching TV. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, at least it helped me to sort of compartmentalise my tiredness. It made me be able to carry on anyway. And um, then you had the World Road Race Championships in your hometown of Yorkshire. Um, you didn't get the result that you wanted. So this is after, so Orla was just over a year old. 
Yeah, um, her birthday was on the Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so you, you don't say you didn't quite get the result that you wanted. Would you say that was to do with having had a baby, or was it nothing to do with that and just external factors coming into play? Oh, good question. Um, well, it'd be easier to blame Orla, wouldn't it? <laughs> Because she can't answer back yet. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was a combination. Definitely it took a huge effort, like monumental effort to get back to that level within a year. I was really proud of the way I race, uh, like the performance in terms of my physical ability, what the, the shape I'd gotten myself in into a year. I was really proud of. I wasn't proud of the way I raced. I raced completely stupidly. Um so I think I actually had a better result in me if I'd have raced a bit smarter. So um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But um, it doesn't matter, does it? Because I think the right woman won the race. Annemiek was clearly the strongest. And I still... On the day, yeah. Be, you know? Like, it doesn't It doesn't matter. Because I guess what what so people are it's so intrigued about is you being continuing to be a professional athlete as a new mum I think it's it's quite rarely done so knowing how that affects you I think is very, is very interesting and knowing that like you say maybe you made the wrong choice on the day in the race as opposed to not having it in you physically so I think I don't know I, I think that's a, a good a good answer and it's good to hear that you can you still you can still give it um right I was just conscious of the time here because we have okay. been chatting away and I know that lots of the audience have got questions for you um so why don't we open it up to the open it up to the floor we open it up to the floor so Hannah here our producer Hannah is putting the questions on the screen they'll be the ones that we will answer so we'll pick out questions from that you've already posted the audience earlier on and if you want to keep them coming in, that's fine. So Lizzie, this one here is from Roz. In the future, Orla wants to follow in your footsteps. Would you encourage her? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would do. Yeah, I think it's an amazing way to, uh, to make a living. Like me and my husband have both had um, incredible careers and ex life experiences because of cycling. So yeah, if she wanted to, then we'd be behind her, yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. Next question from Ian. Who do you see as your main rival and what do you make of Annemiek van Vluten's success? Uh, well, I think Annemiek van Vluten is, yeah, phenomenal. I think if you've watched any of the kind of training that she's done over the winter, the stuff that she's been talking about, it's just, yeah, mind blowing the stuff that she can do in training. So I think her mindset is different to anybody in the peloton. Um and it would have been interesting to be able to race against her this year. I mean, I train completely differently to her. So um, it would have been interesting to to put, to pit myself against her this year. I'm, I'm disappointed that I don't get to do that because I, you know, felt really good. So um, I think she is the main rival of everybody in the peloton, actually, at the moment. <laughs> fair point, fair point. And from Craig. Um, are you joining Geraint on his Zwift marathon? Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I have a confession to make. I am a Swift virgin. I've never been on it. And um, yeah, I just I'm I'm not a virtual person. Can you not tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've got that far with this one. <laughs> Just want to ride your bike and be outdoors. Um, from Kevin here, do you think there should be female tours that run, run alongside the men's? Yeah, I think it's a really good model, a successful model. Um, I think the the races that have been run alongside men's races previously have shown that if there is an existing fan base there who enjoy cycling, then if you expose them to women cycling on the same day, same event, same atmosphere, etc., then they're going to become fans of women cycling too. So it's kind of win-win, I think. Brilliant. I'm sure you get asked about women's stuff quite a lot. And from Matt here. So Lizzie, who would you most like to interview? Don't, don't say me. Um, who's, who's inspired you? Oh, he's inspired me. Um, 
I mean, I went to watch Serena Williams in Wimbledon when I was six months pregnant, and it's the first time I'd seen her in real life. And she is a phenomenal athlete. Like to see her in real life was incredible. I couldn't believe just the sheer force that she had. So, I mean, she's a mum. Um, she's an entrepreneur. She's all sorts. I'd be really intrigued to speak to her because she's battled through some pretty. Um, yeah, some hard stuff in her career, and I think she'd be an inspiring person to learn from. And what would your what would your first question be, or if you had one question for her? Oof. I'm intrigued by this topic. The two, I can imagine the two of you. I'm like playing it out in my head. It's a good. <laughs> it's a good. It's a powerful scenario. This. Uh, I'd ask her if she wanted to come for a bike ride. I think that's the best <laughs> place to talk to someone, isn't it? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so it's the new goal. All right. From Rebecca, um, you guys know each other. Uh, <laughs> brilliant question. Do you have any time to binge watch Netflix? And if so, what's your lockdown recommendation? Asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, me and Philip, honestly, are useless at Netflix. We're just not even technology people so actually we um turned we turned on the tv the other day and realized that it was a smart tv for the first time and um my friend had been staying in our house for a little bit while she was um yeah she was between houses and anyway she'd been staying in our house and had realized that she already is a smart tv and i thought our tv was stolen because it had this username in it that i didn't recognize <laughs> but basically it was my friend anyway long story but no we don't watch netflix we're useless we did actually get into the nest that finished last night on bbc that was really good i thought but no we don't i can relate that i only joined netflix two weeks ago and as i've been saying to rebecca i've just been like i just lost my life to it all i do now is watch netflix it's really dangerous i'm like 10 years late to the party <laughs> You get yourself a one and a half year old, it solves the problem. <laughs> all right, I'll just uh, get one of those off. <laughs> You're welcome to all at any time. Oh, brilliant. She looks lovely. I love this question. I saw this earlier uh, from Nikki here. Hey, Nikki. Um, if Lizzie, so if you could only get one type of food in lockdown, great question, what would it be? Oof. It's tough. For myself or for my family? Oh, you're such a good person for yourself. Uh, mature cheddar cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the food, the nutrition of an athlete. Yeah, can't go wrong with that. Uh, brilliant. And Tom, yes, our guy from the States. Yo, he saw you win in Richmond VA. How did it? How did you like racing in the USA and how is it different than over there, over here? Over I there? loved the race, absolutely loved it. The fans on the course were incredible. Um, my only slight negative about Richmond was the fact that the podium ceremony, like normally at the World Championships, is right on the finish line outside, so you get to share it with the fans. But in Richmond, they did it like in this kind of industrial hall place away from the race so there was hardly anybody there and the people that were there were shopping at the kind of stalls in there so it was all a bit odd yeah wow yeah but, but other yeah. than that like philadelphia world cup that used to be in america was also a really good race uh, the fans are just uh enthusiastic and in a way a bit crazier than european fans it's a bit of a stiff upper lip over here still yeah, potentially. I think, yeah, they dress up a bit more in America and don't take themselves at all seriously. <laughs> Love it. So we've got this next question I saw lined up from Josh. What's your favourite climb in Donegal? Oh, it'd have to be Specific. Nathala. Um, steep, short, hard climb, but the view over the top over Notgala Beach um, is beautiful. No idea where you're talking about. Oh, it's stunning. <laughs> you should go to Donegal. Everybody should go to Donegal. <laughs> All right, I'll hop on a plane. I'll wait a minute. Um, right, we're going to have two more questions and then we're going to wrap this up. So, Hannah, what have we got? Oh, from Hannah here. What? 
Brilliant. What is your favourite race? The Tour of Flanders. Yeah. Cool. Simple question, simple answer. Ace. And our final question for you from Cycle Tourer in Manchester. How do you prevent boredom on the turbo trainer? Please help us out with this one, Lizzie. Oh my goodness, I wish I had oh. an answer. Just don't do it. Get really unfit and then really enjoy yourself and suffer really hard when you're allowed back outside. That's my <laughs> tip. Oh, that is a fantastic answer. Oh, no, it's not a very um, responsible answer, is it? That Everybody needs to stay fit and healthy and to motivate yourself, you should watch uh, Beyonce on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And on that note, um, everyone in your chat, in the live comments, please, can we give some hearts over to Lizzie, who's shared her time with us this evening? Unfortunately, we've not been able to see her, but she's been fantastic in uh, giving us some audio answers. So like I said, we can't see the hearts if you just press a heart. We need to see it in the chat bar, in the comments. Um, so if you can put those through, then we'll all know, instead of a round of applause, how much we've loved having Lizzie on this evening. Thank you so much. Um, Lizzie, enjoy your evening and lots of love to you and the family. Thanks very much. Sorry about not being able to uh, see me, but maybe <laughs> next time. Maybe next time. Bye. And for those of you uh, still here next week, we've got the amazing Rebecca Charlton on. We're going to be diving into some deep and profound issues. Again, get yourself a drink. I'm nearly through mine. And um, join us every week for the next few weeks here with Cycling UK. And please do check out our website and the NHS signups as well. See you later. Bye.